Rochester Castle stands within the walls of the Roman city above the River Medway in Kent. There has been an important crossing of the road to London since the 1st century AD and it was the Normans as they advanced across the country from the south coast building strongholds from which to exert their power over the locals who first built a wooden castle here after their victory at the Battle of Hastings. Between 1087 and 1089 the castle was rebuilt in stone, one of the earliest such buildings in the country by Gundolf, Bishop of Rochester and in 1127 the present keep was erected under Henry I, son of William the Conqueror. Rochester Castle endured the Great Siege by King John in 1215, one of the longest sieges in medieval history, and some years later the siege of the barons rebelling against his son Henry III. It has stood for nearly a thousand years, surviving the machinery of early warfare, fire, revolt and neglect, serving as the prison of Elizabeth, Queen of Scots, and becoming a visitor attraction in Victorian public gardens. It remains a towering ruin confronting Rochester Cathedral at the heart of the city, a sight to remind visitors today, as it would have done in earlier times, of those two most powerful authorities of medieval England, the Crown and the Church. This defensive ditch ran right around the bailey on its landward sides it was originally deeper than it appears at the present day and would have been a formidable obstacle to any attacking force. Built in the years following 1127 by Archbishop William de Corbeil, the keep provided the most prestigious accommodation in the castle and was also its strongest defensive structure. Its entrance was via a fore building which was protected by a guard tower, drawbridge and portcullis. During the civil war that broke out shortly after the Magna Carta in 1215, King John himself lay siege to Rochester Castle. It was defended by a hundred knights and other ranks hostile to the King who camped here, probably on Bowley Hill, for more than seven weeks. Five huge catapults were set up to pound the keep and outer walls with rocks. When this strategy proved ineffective, the king ordered his soldiers to dig a tunnel under the keep's southern tower, the one nearest to us now. This tunnel was held up with wooden props, which were then burnt, bringing down a quarter of the entire keep. Despite this, the garrison did not surrender and had to be starved out of the ruins. Today, we can see how the round shape of the rebuilt tower makes it stand out from its square companions. Rebuilt in about 1250 and further strengthened in about 1370, this heavily fortified gate was the main entrance into the castle. This enclosure provided work areas and accommodation for the many men at arms, servants and tradesmen who were attached to the castle. It also provided a suitable area for outdoor military sports and contests. This fascinating site can tell us a great deal about life, war and politics in the early Middle Ages. Much has, however, been lost. We are standing by the site of the heavily fortified main gate of the castle. Outside it, leading towards the cathedral, was an arched causeway and drawbridge spanning the castle ditch, which is now partly filled in. A high outer wall joined the gate with the towers that we can still see behind us. Ahead, it crossed the line of the modern road and led down to the river. This is a 19th century reconstruction of a fortified bastion, which was built between 1378 and 1383. 
it would have overlooked the Rochester entrance to the old bridge over the Medway which crossed the river about a hundred yards upstream of the bridges we can see today. All that remains of it is the stone balustrade that we can see along the river bank which was moved there when the bridge was demolished in 1857. The view to our left shows how much of the river foreshore has been reclaimed in order to build the road and gardens. During the medieval period the water at high tide would have lapped against the small cliff on which the castle is built making its high walls seem even more formidable. This protected the bailey and keep from any attack from the riverside. It dominated the medieval bridge over the river Medway. In front of us lie the wide expanse of the castle bailey. During the reign of Henry III, 1216 to 1272, this was divided in two with a fortified wall costing over £20 to build. It had its own gatehouse and ran in front of the keep from around where we are standing to meet the far wall by the right hand tower. The tower to the left was only built in the 14th century. Henry also added many other buildings to the castle bailey. Behind us there is evidence of where one of them stood against the river wall perhaps the safest site inside the castle. We know the king built himself a chamber in 1221 to which he added a chapel 23 years later. In the wall we can see the arches of a vaulted cellar under the king's chamber and the square holes for joists supporting the first floor. The first stone castle built on this site in 1088 consisted simply of a high wall enclosing a number of timber buildings. The ruins of this wall along with some of the additions and alterations which increased its strength and usefulness over the years. Edward III was responsible for many of these after a series of surveys revealed major defects in the fabric of the 14th century castle. In front of us there are some of the results of Edward's work. From 1367 to 1370 his builders reconstructed the 11th century wall here and added two towers. The one nearest the keep stands on earlier 12th century foundations and straddles the wall. The other was brand new and projects fully out towards the castle ditch. It is also much more elaborate with internal vaulting and garderobes or toilets. The main door to the keep is safely located up on a high first floor. Under the modern stairs we can see stone steps leading up to this doorway with its decorated arch. A deep pit here would have been spanned with a drawbridge. At the corner of the keep where the stairs turn sharply to the right the medieval visitor would have been confronted with a narrow watchtower. An arch which would have formed the roof of the passageway still sticks out from the wall. We can also see another arch now filled in which would have provided access to the main keep. This room was the original entrance chamber to the main castle keep built by Archbishop William de Corbeil in 1127. To reach the first floor entrance visitors had to climb a set of external stairs just as we have done today. Entry to the main part of the keep is through this inner arched doorway and down the steps to the wooden viewing platforms. This entrance was also fortified with a portcullis, a heavy wooden grille which could be dropped down quickly. We can see the grooves in the sides of the doorway where it ran. Behind the portcullis there would have been strong wooden doors secured by a sliding wooden bar. Again the deep holes are still visible.
This is the level of the state apartments. Here the cross wall is replaced by an arcade of magnificent columns and supporting arches which separate the great hall from the great chamber beyond. For most of the time the larger arches were blocked off by wooden, later stone partitions. These rooms would have been the most luxurious in the keep, representing the height of good living for the period. Today we can only imagine the trappings of wealth that would have graced this room when a feast or ceremony took place. The hall would have been full of people dressed in their finest clothes and the walls would have been covered with decorative hangings. The broken arch above us on the opposite wall is a clue to a violent period in the castle's history, the Great Siege of 1215. The barons at war with King John had seized Rochester Castle. They found it poorly supplied but had little time to remedy this as John's forces attacked on the third day. Siege engines pounded the castle's defences but still the keep held out. King John put his men to work to pick a hole in the foot of the southeast tower and brace it with wooden pit props. It is recorded that the props were set alight using the fat of 40 pigs causing the tower to collapse. John's forces swarmed in but the defenders continued to resist. They retreated behind the cross wall and held out for a week before finally surrendering. The turret was rebuilt to be round rather than square as round towers are more difficult to undermine. This gallery, which looked down into the state apartments, runs right round the building. It is hollowed out of the thickness of the wall and therefore greatly reduces the weight of the upper stories. At this height, the walls do not need the massive strength of lower walls as they are out of reach of enemy battering rams. The gallery had a number of uses and could be partitioned off to make extra rooms for guests probably servants and less favoured visitors. When the Great Hall was in use, guests could gather here to chat and look down on the festivities. This was also a good position for groups of minstrels to provide music for those below. Unfortunately, at the time of our visit, the battlements, the very top of the keep, were closed off to the public due to high winds from Storm Hannah and also due to renovation work that was being carried out throughout the castle. The chapel was an essential part of the building as religion was an important part of daily life. The lord of the castle would have visited the chapel every day. 
The entrance we have just used did not exist until later in the castle's history. In earlier times there was a sedil, a stone seat set in the wall where the priest would sit. The original entrance was through the arch at the far end, now barred, that leads to the Great Hall. This enclosed chamber probably served as both a rubbish dump and cesspit. Periodically this would have had to be cleaned out, and as the only way out was back up through the main entrance to the keep, it was presumably something that happened when the castle owner was not in residence. As in the food store area, the opening in the outer wall of the keep was made at a much later date. 